Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Barton H.B. Hollister at Greater Southwest Insurance Company. Oh, not Hollister in Phoenix, Arizona. That's right. Oh, here we go again. What was that, sir? Nothing, nothing at all. Just go right ahead. Yes. Now, Mr. Dollar, I want you to arrange airplane transportation for yourself out here immediately. Oh, you do, huh? What's your problem? You are to protect the life of one of our clients. Ah, uh, Mr. Hollister. His name is Henry Kirkham. And I shall expect you out here in Arizona without delay. Now, wait just a minute. Let me be perfectly honest about this. Please do. I have never liked, do not now like, and never will like these bodyguard assignments. As far as I'm concerned, they're for the birds. I beg your pardon? What's more, you have a whale of a good police department out there in Phoenix, and if somebody needs protection, why not call on them? Mr. Dollar. Yes? Did I say that Mr. Kirkham lives here in Phoenix? No, I guess you didn't. And did I uh, in any way imply that you wouldn't be paid most handsomely for this service? Oh? Like maybe a how much? sizable extra consideration if you can turn whoever is threatening our client's life over to the proper authorities. Is that so? Yes. Well, Mr. Hollister, you have just struck a very responsive chord. Yes, I thought I would. So I'll expect you here immediately. Well, it's pretty late in the day, but if I can get a night flight, maybe I'll see you first thing in the morning. Not before? I'll look into the plane schedules. Yes, I suggest that you do. But first, why don't we discuss just how much this extra fee goodbye, is... Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. What? I said goodbye, Now, sir. wait a minute, I'll Mr. I'll be ha expecting you. But unless we can agree... A Hello? Hello? Okay, friend. Just wait till you see my expense account. CBS Radio brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company in Phoenix, Arizona. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the captain's table matter. Up till now, I had always managed to avoid any assignments from Barton H.B. Hollister. He was an egotistical, finicky, penny-pinching stuffed shirt. Always demanded rather than asked. Had no patience for anybody else's opinion. Still, I had no other assignment at the moment. And he had promised an extra fat fee. So... Expense account item one, four dollars and... No, let's get this thing started right. Call it six dollars even for a cab to Bradley Field. Item two, $150.70 plane fare, plus ten bucks for incidentals. As promised, it was early next morning by the time we circled for a landing at the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. Item three, well, let's say five bucks for a cab into the office on Adams Street. The day was young, the weather clear, people along the way were bright and cheerful, and I felt pretty good myself. But Mr. Barton H.B. Hollister, wow. All right now, Dollar, where have you been? Sit down. Where have I been? I might have known this would happen. Sit down, I said. Do you mind telling me what you had for breakfast? What I had for breakfast? Well, it's obvious that something has got you all upset. Quite true, you have. I phoned Mr. Kirkham last night and told him you'd be here right away. I took the first plane I could get. Well, you're too late. Too late for what? A few hours after I told him you were on your way, Henry Kirkham was found dead. No kidding. Didn't need your protection, eh? I didn't say that, Mr. Hollister. You certainly implied as much. All I said But was... that's neither here nor there now. The simple fact is that Henry Kirkham, insured by our company for over $70,000, has been murdered. Or uh, has committed suicide. Oh, now I get the picture. What do you mean? You hope I can prove it was suicide. Of course. Then this company of yours won't have to pay off the insurance. Over $70,000. You said that. There's far more to this matter, Mr. Dollar. Like what? The police apparently believe it was murder. Well, if they can prove it, you're stuck. Wait, please. The only suspect they're holding is a man by the name of Walter Pinkley 
who happens to be Henry Kirkham's beneficiary. Well, then what's your problem? If he did kill Mr. Kirkham and they can prove it, you certainly don't have to pay him the insurance. You're quite right. The money will go to whatever other person or persons are entitled to it under the laws of succession. But now, bear this in mind. Go on. Walter Pinkley is also one of our policyholders. Hmm. That's interesting. So if he did commit this murder, as the police suspect... And he goes to the gas chamber. You're stuck with the payment on his policy, too. Exactly. If it was suicide, you pay nobody. Right. But if it was murder, you stand to pay off on both of them. Correct. Well, the police must have some reason for thinking it was murder. Oh, yes, yes, they have. Well, then, if you don't mind, I'll pack up and head on back to Hartford. No, Mr. Dollar, you won't. Well, give me one good reason why I should get into a hassle with the police. I have assigned you to this investigation, and I have agreed to pay your expenses out here. Plus a nice fat bonus, remember? I remember. That doesn't mean I have to accept the job. You'd rather absorb the cost of your trip out here yourself and the return fare? Oh, now, just a minute. Very well. Now, rent yourself a car at our company's expense and get over to Tuttle immediately. <sighs> okay. All right. You win. Who is Tuttle? Tuttle is not a who, it's a where. It's a small town, 30 or 35 miles north and east of here, where this murder or this suicide occurred. I suggest you contact the police first. His name is Alfred Appleby. His name? Then see the people at the Yucca Flower Rest Home. That's where both Kirkham and Pinkley live. Rest Home? Yes, it's a small, exclusive place in the outskirts of that little town, mostly for people with lung trouble. Okay. Good. Now, Mr. Hollister. Yes, my boy. Now that you've roped me into this thing... Well, hardly roped. That extra fee that we were talking about. If you can show that Kirkham was a suicide, thus saving us from having to pay out all that insurance, and I understand you are very good at this sort of thing... When it's justified. Well, of course, of course. And I'm sure we understand each other. How much, Mr. Hollister? Prove it was suicide. A thousand dollars. Only $2,000 for saving you all that money. All right, all right. $1,500. And what if I find that Pinkley did it? Then we have to pay on both policies? Well, there'll be no extra fee then. Of course not. But as I say, if it was suicide, and you can convince the police of it... 2000 Now, dollar. Or shall I hitchhike my way on back to Hartford? Very well, 2000 In either case. Yes, yes, in either case. Now get to work. You know, Hollister, a little urging, and you're not such a tight-fisted old coot at that. I beg your pardon. Um, granted. <laughs> Item four, $50 deposit on a rental car. I drove north through Glendale and Cave Creek, and then east and a bit south to the town of Tuttle. There were a couple of general stores, one of them closed... A gas station and a rickety old one-story building marked City Hall. That's where I stopped. And believe it or not, it's only occupant in a small corner room with bars on the door. That's right, young man. Uh, my name is Walter Pinkley. The police chief, who was also the mayor, has gone out to the rest home again. Well, I'm Johnny Dollar, Mr. Pinkley. I represent the company that insured the life of Mr. Henry Kirkham. Oh, poor Henry. Oh, it's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Pretty terrible for you, sir, if you killed him. Now, isn't that the most absurd idea, Mr. Dollar, putting me in jail this way? Is it? But well, I suppose that police and that Chief Appleby feels he has to point to someone as a suspect. Why did he pick on you, sir? Well, after all, Mr. Dollar, I was the only one to have visited with him there at his cottage at the rest home last night. And I'd told everybody I was going to spend the evening with him. I mean, everybody at the captain's table. Why did you call on Mr. Kirkham? Because he was my friend. Henry was the only one who appreciated my ability as a composer. A composer of what, Mr. Pinkley? Why, right here. Let me show you. Here now. <laughs> Do you see? This is the new concerto I'm working on. This will be my finest musical composition. Oh, um... Concerto. You, you understand music, Mr. Dollar? Well, not enough to appreciate this, I'm afraid. Oh, that's too bad. So few people do, and now that Henry is gone. By the way, did you know that he left all of his insurance to me? So I understand. That was wonderfully sweet of him. 
And now I'll be able to buy a piano for my little cottage and, and compose and compose and compose. I wonder. Oh, there's no need to wonder about it at all, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I shall. Uh, just how much do you know about the circumstances of Mr. Kirkham's death? Well, not very much, I'm afraid. You see, I went round to his cottage after supper last night. Why, sir? Well, Henry had been worried about something of late. I, I don't know exactly what. He, he never told me in spite of our friendship. Had he any other good friends there at the rest home? <laughs> With all the petty jealousies and the people just sitting around getting annoyed at each other over nothing at all... No. No, Henry and I were the only real friends. I see. All the rest of them, well, I, I don't want to use the word hate, but, well, if it weren't for the almost magical curative properties of the air and the cli <coughs> climate. D touch of lung trouble, you know. Now, Mr. Pinkley... And, uh, as long as I stay here, I feel just fine. And so do the others. Yeah, well, now... It's this... added at least ten years to my life. I'm sure it has. But, uh, as I started to say... It was about 8 o'clock when I dropped in to visit Henry, and we looked over some of my music and talked and talked and, and, and had a gay old time. Sounds like a ball. Now, tell me, at what time did yeah, you... But even so, he was, well, well, depressed and worried. Mr. Pinkley. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, yes. At what time did you leave, Mr. Kirkham? Well, I guess about 10 o'clock. He said he had to write a very important letter in case... In case... In case of what, Mr. Pinkley? Well, I, I'm not quite sure, but during supper he had mentioned that someone was coming to see him. He'd had a phone call that someone was coming to see him to, um, and, and to help him, I, I, I think. And, and in case that someone didn't arrive in time... Well, I, I'm not quite sure just what he meant. I think I have a pretty good idea. Then this morning when they found him lying there in his cottage with, with that horrible pistol beside him... Mr. Dollar, I never dreamed that Henry would commit suicide. Suicide? Surely you don't think that anyone would have killed him. Not even you? Good heavens, no. When he was always so nice to me and changing his insurance to me and all. Well, apparently somebody thinks you did it. Oh, they'll find out. <laughs> they'll find out, don't you worry. In the meantime, it's so nice and peaceful here in this jail and, and I can work all undisturbed on my concerto. I've been working four years on it, Mr. Dollar. And in another four or oh, five years, I... Mr. Pinkley, I sincerely hope you'll be around long enough to finish it. What? Uh, what did you say? Nothing, nothing. I'll, um, I'll see you later. I learned a long, long time ago that the most unlikely person may often be a killer. But this sweet old Walter Pinkley, never. At least not in my book. I got back into my car and I drove on out to the Yucca Flower Rest Home. In addition to a small office building, there were eight or ten neat little cottages on the side of a tree-covered hill. A car in front of the office had the word police badly printed across the side in nearly foot-high letters. And as I pulled up to a stop, a heavy-set man of about 50, wearing boots, jeans, a blue cotton shirt with a string tie, and a beat-up officer's cap with a badge in the front of it came out to meet me. You must be Johnny Dollar, right? That's right, Chief Appleby. Howdy. But you got here too late, Dollar. How do you mean, too late, Chief? Well, I mean, I got it all sewed up. Have you? Yes, sir. I suspected this so-called pal of his right in the beginning, right from the time I found out he'd just been named the new beneficiary of the dead man's insurance. Walter Pinkley? Yes, sir. He just couldn't wait to see now a little crackpot. Didn't realize that trying to make it look like suicide might cancel out that insurance. Why do you think it was Pinkley? Think, Doc. Think. Well, that was on the beginning. Now I know. You see, now I got what you'd call uh, uncontroversial proof. You see, Mr. Dollar, it was all made up to look like suicide. I mean, in there all by himself, just laying there in the middle of the floor, shot right through the right temple, real close up, like as if he'd done it himself. Well, now, Chief... Yeah, and, and the old-fashioned 32 h and R there beside him, like as if it fell out of his hand. Did you check that gun for fingerprints? Not a sign of any prints on it anywhere. Now, you know he'd have to have his own prints on it if he'd done it himself. 
Yeah, I guess it would. Only one, uh, only one note to have been in to see him last night was that old Walter Pinkley, right? Well, now, Chief, that still doesn't prove that... But Mr... what Pinkley didn't figure on was that, that Kirkham was already scared of him and he'd sent for you. And Pinkley also didn't know that sometime last night Kirkham wrote you a letter just in case. Chief, I have reason to believe he wrote that after Mr. Pinkley... Now, wait now, wait now. Just let me finish, huh? Go ahead. This, uh, this letter was there on his desk, and... Well, I got to admit I didn't take a look at it until a few minutes ago, but here, here... Look at it for yourself. See? Pins the murder on Pinkley and nobody else. Read it. I mean, if you can, that handwriting's kind of old-fashioned. Mr. Johnny Dollar, honored sir. So is the salutation, Chief. Huh? A bit old-fashioned. Honored sir. Yeah, real formal. There is within this place one who would avenge himself upon my life. How do you like that language? Sounds like an old Shakespearean actor. Well, that's exactly what he was, an old ham actor. Now, let's see now. Nor have I been remiss in my endeavor to assuage the passion that manifestly has provoked his wish for my demise. It means he tried to talk this other one out of it, out of trying to kill him. Yeah, fine. Thanks, Chief. But... Alas, I had made it only too clear I could no longer abide as ridiculous con... Hmm? Conchettos? Conchertos, that's what he meant. Well, maybe so, but it's spelled C-O-N-C-E-T-T-O-S. Conchettos. Well, it's, it's that handwriting. He meant concerto. He couldn't stand that concerto anymore. It's all that that old Pinkley ever talked about. But, but, but go on. And so, because of my resentment over his stupid conchettos... Uh, concerto. All right, concerto, concerto, whatever it is. He seeks revenge. Yeah. Unless he seek to destroy me ere you come to afford me protection, I tell you now that his name... Uh, turn it over. But hark, there sounds a knock upon my door. I shall finish this anon. That's all, huh? Well, it's all I need. He thought the knock on the door was you. He let the other guy in, got himself killed. I wish he'd had a chance to finish this to actually name the man he suspected. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute, Dollar. You want anything more clear than that? Nobody else had a concerto. Pinkley's guilty, and that's that. Maybe. Well, sure he is. The others at the captain's table, Pinkley said. What's that? They all knew I was coming here, so if one of them wanted to kill him, he knew he'd have to do it right away. Sure, and one of them was Pinkley. Same group of five at that same table. Three meals a day, week after week, year after year. Five, huh? Who are the others? Did you check on that? Oh, I sure did. Uh, kind of, they were the only ones that would know the most about not only Kirkham, but Walter Pinkley, too. Well, who are they, those five? The other three besides Kirkham and Pinkley? An old lady named uh, Ms. Uh, Sarah Sanderson. man who calls himself Captain Howard. Another old fellow named David... David Hesher. Well, get them together, Chief. I want to talk to them. What for? As long as we know who did it. Just as a favor. All right, all right. Anything you say. Something had suddenly rung a bell. I picked up a dictionary in the office. I looked up a word in it. And then took it along to meet the group, one at a time, in one of the little cottages. Mrs. Sanderson, in her late 70s, was a sweet little soul who was so unnerved that all she did was cry during the interview. Old David Hesher is mind-failing. Well, he was no help at all. But Captain Eustace Howard... Well, I certainly don't find anything mysterious about this case, Mr. Dollar. If you want my opinion... Which I didn't. After all, I speak from years of using this excellent mind of mine to solve far more complex problems than this. What a blowhard. But, of course, my extreme modesty uh, forbids me to laud uh, my own accomplishment. Unconscionable bore. Uh, nevertheless, I am convinced. Like that insurance man, Hollister. I, out of my vast experience and confidence... I, 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 I can I, assure I. you that uh, Chief Appleby is entirely right in holding uh, Walter Pinkley. Captain Howard. Pinkley and his ridiculous... 
concerto. Now, Captain... I could have composed that for him in a month, in a week. I told him as much. I'm sure you did. But would he avail himself of my superlative uh, musical knowledge? Now, wait a minute, will you? Will you wait just a minute? You don't want my opinion. I don't think I need it anymore. Oh, really? Chief? Yeah, darling? You and Pinkley both told me that Kirkham changed his beneficiary recently. Sure, to name Pinkley. Which I maintain explains why Walter Pinkley killed him. Just hold it, Captain, please. Very well, very well. Chief, who was the beneficiary before? It was this very group of people, darling. Mrs. Sanderson, David Hesher, and the captain here. And, of course, Pinkley, too. It was to be split up equal. Well, and that's it. Well, what is? These other people were cut off by the chain. And I assure you, Mr. Dollar, to me, that made no difference. Oh, be quiet, will you? Really? Tie that fact in with the letter, Chief. So that, that letter pins it on Pinkley, and that's that. And didn't you wonder why the killer left the letter on Kirkham's desk? He must have seen it. I am convinced that Pinkley overlooked it in his excitement over what he'd done. Well, I am convinced that the killer misread that letter the same as we did, that he left it there because he felt sure it would convict old Pinkley. And you, Captain, and this dictionary prove it. Well, I, I don't get you, darling. I am certain that I don't. That word, concetto. Only what he meant was, was concerto. No, that's just the point. Because do you know what concetto means? It's an old-fashioned Italian word that means conceit. Huh? Unusual term, but so are a lot of others in that letter. Well, sure. Concetto means conceit. So add them up. When the beneficiary was changed, this silly, conceited old Captain Howard here was cut off. I beg your pardon. Along with a couple of others. But I doubt if they cared. Only the captain did. Oh, see here. He didn't like the snub that it implied. Any more than he liked being turned down by Pinkley over that music, so he had to get even. Mr. Dollar! If he could make it look like suicide, he not only would get even, but nobody would get that insurance. So he knocked off Kirkham and set it up that way, and I'll bet he made sure that Kirkham's prints were on the gun. Keep talking, Dollar. But then he found the letter, that unfinished letter, and he thought that it put the finger on Pinkley. Now he could get even with both of them. I will not listen to such drivel. Take it easy, Captain. That's when he wiped the prince off the gun. Dollar! So only Pinkley would be suspect because of the letter he thought. But the letter, talking about his stupid, ridiculous concetto, his conceit, gave him away. You thought the letter would clear you, Captain, but that was one big, fat mistake. Yeah. Very well. I... Killed Kirkham. That's all I wanted to hear. Just put on these cuffs. Oh, come now. Would you take me off, make me suffer, maybe die, like a common person, for the one very small mistake? Me? Captain Eustace Langhorn Avery Hard? Me? Yeah, Captain. You. <laughs> Mr. Barton H.B. Hollister, you'd better shed a bit of your conceit and pay me not only that fee you promised, but an expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, and believe me, all the incidentals I could possibly cook up, a total of $438 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the fog closing in over a dark, abandoned pier in San Diego. A killer on the loose. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato, Jr., Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Edgar Staley as Walter Pinkley, Richard Kendrick as Barton Hollister, John Griggs as Captain Eustace Howard, and Jim Bowles as Chief Appleby. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>